So we're just going to assume that we're here. All right. cool. What's up, everybody? How's everybody doing? Welcome to uh, Breeder Syndicate. Today we're going to go and talk about the sequel to what we were discussing last uh, episode, which was the early years of the Dutch seed banks. Yep. So, I mean, kind of last year we, uh, or last, last time, so to speak, we chatted a lot about how they got started. We chatted about Neville and all that. And we kind of, um, we kind of took us, took everybody through like the first three or four years. Um, you know, I see that there's a bunch of cool questions this week that have already popped up. So we'll get to that in a little bit, but we're going to kind of start on, um, we're going to kind of start and take you guys through like, um, the last say like 10 years or so of, uh, of Neville's influence and kind of his history. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we got a bunch of notes and things like that. We'll hold up some stuff on occasion to give you guys some ideas, all that, all that type of stuff. So, um, you know, uh, probably the, the easiest way to start is to say that in, uh, in 1990, in uh, 1988, um, that was kind of when, Neville had been in business like three years or so. And that's when he kind of started to sort out like favorites among amongst what's he, what he had. He had had to, uh, he'd collected a number of cuttings from America by then. He dealt with a bunch of breeders by then he had, um, bred with a number of these things for three or four years in some cases at this point. And that's where his uh, collection started to go from sort of a, a hodgepodge grab bag of things to more of the famous stuff that we all became familiar with when we started getting into weed history. Uh, Northern Lights 1, Northern Lights 2, uh, G13, you know, Hash Plant, NL, you know, NL Hazes and stuff like that. So um, 88 to 90 is kind of really when um, people are probably like more familiar with that stuff. Yeah. Um, because he you know, he'd, he'd sort of settled on what worked for him. Yeah. Right. Where before he'd been just kind of playing around with everything. He really didn't know what he'd had. Um, people had sent him stuff. People had, he'd bought things off various folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, you know, but these are just names to him, to us, you, you get NL, you get maple leaf, you get haze. That all means something because there's a lot of history behind it, but probably sure. to him, there was just a lot of, they were just literally names from dudes. Well, early on, he was sourcing a lot of seeds and later on, and over those three years, he became a breeder as opposed to just sourcing and passing on genetics. He actually started working lines, which is, which is where these amazing lines come from. Yeah. And he, he, and he had done a bunch of breeding and he sort of figured out what was an inconsistent pain in the ass for lack of a yeah. better term and what was consistent. Um, you know, Neville was always, um, he was always sensitive to what people wanted uh, you know, he wanted to sell seeds. He wanted to make yeah. people happy. And so uh, people weren't happy a lot of times with incredibly variable stuff that didn't perform well. And so he, uh, you know, he had started to figure out what males were good to use repeatedly, um, what females were champs and yeah. bred well with lots of different stuff. And so we're going to we're going to start kind of, you know, walking through some of that type of thing. Okay, um, which one do you want to start with first? Um, maybe we should start with, we, we kind of talked a lot about uh, Northern Lights last time. That was yeah. probably one of the things that we expounded upon the most. Yeah. So maybe we could chat about, because 1988 is when things dramatically changed Yeah. Uh, in that regard. From 85 to 87, he just sort of sold a variety of weird hybrids of Northern Lights. Mm -hmm. And you kind of got, you just bought straight NL. Northern Lights. Yeah. It was a grab bag of all the different types. Yeah. Well, by by 88, he had decided that there was two lines that really made the most sense, NL1 and NL2. Yeah. Uh, NL1 was sort of like a broadleafed Afghan. Um, possibly you could call it a Bubba type, you know, wide yeah. leaf, frosty, golf ball type, uh, you know, nugs, almost maybe slightly yellowish. Mm -hmm. um, and that was probably one of his most consistent lines he had, uh, because he took all the Northern lights and he bred them together. Yeah. Right. Uh, independently. And so in 88, he offered what was called NL one F three yep. and NL two F three. I wish I could put these up on the screen, but I can't cause I don't have the controls. 
Yeah, so it's we'll just have to so, read it. We'll just have to read it. So, so basically, um, you know, those two things they became, and we'll talk about a little bit more later. But these kind of became like mainstays in cannabis for quite some time. They became permanent additions, right? Yeah. Um, as well as that, as well as offering them pure. So let's figure he gets them in 80, 84. He starts messing around with them in 85 ish by 88. He'd had, you know, three years of having them. He'd taken them to F3, mm -hmm. right. And he was releasing them as a, as a more consistent variety. Yeah. And so that's the first 88 is the first is the first year that those two things pop up. Right. Yeah. And it's also the first year that you start seeing. So in addition to offering both of those strains as straight itself, you start seeing NL2 and NL1 being used as breeding males in all kinds of stuff that he had. Yeah. Right. Um, NL1, I, there's probably nothing that he used as much as a breeding male as NL1. Is that uh, the, the, the biggest one, the biggest focus on the company as a male overall? looking back yeah i would say so i mean you can you can look at stuff and um you know he a lot of the you know a lot of the stuff that he had you know that he got his cuttings for instance um like hash plant um yeah. hash plant he first offered his hash plant by nl1 yeah he gets yeah. big bud as a cutting he offers it as big bud by nl1 yeah um you know he gets uh he gets a variety of things and he starts crossing it by nl1 88 is interesting too because you know he had gotten these old haze seeds from Sam Skunkman mm -hmm. and uh, in addition to some other people in Holland. And 88 is the first year that any kind of haze hybrid pops up. And it's one that maybe a lot of people haven't heard of, right? Yeah. Uh, it's very weird. It's haze by NL1. Uh, and so it was only offered for one year. But what's unique about it is that all the other haze hybrids he offered used haze as a male. Yeah. This actually was a female that he found that he called haze B. Yes. Right. So there's this one year where all of a sudden you could get haze B by NL1. And of all things, it was NL1 ruderalis. Yeah. So uh, that's the first time that haze pops up that I'm aware of in a catalog in Holland. Okay. Uh, I think so. Yeah. You know, so. that, that, that's, that's, I do think you're right. Um, and it was because he hadn't settled on, he hadn't, you know, he, he was still experimenting a little bit, but he'd figured out some things. Yeah. Right. He had also, um, he'd gone to America and he had acquired through Jorge Cervantes's connections in the Pacific Northwest, uh, in the Oregon, uh, Washington area. Mm -hmm. uh, Jorge had hooked him up with some unknown uh, growers, and those unknown growers gave him G13 and what became known as the Pacific Northwest hash plant. Uh, both of those things ended up getting used pretty extensively in future years. Yeah. Right? So, um, you know, he he also, I don't know if, I don't know if Matt can show it or not, um, but he, the 87 update, I don't know. I can't do you it. Don't have, you don't have, you can't do it. So yeah. he, he offered this 87 update. One of the things that was cool about Neville is that he, he gave a lot more data on what the hell he was doing versus most other breeders. He it was ex just like extensive, put, especially in that 87 update. That's really like more data than most growers back then would have even given a fuck about. Oh, yeah. I, I'm he, glad he did. He, he lays it out. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. um, you know, he, uh, he starts talking about it and he talks about basically both the hash plant and the big bud that he crossed to NL one. Yes. And then he took that and he back crossed it, uh, males of that back to the original. And mm -hmm. so that's how he became, that's how big bud and hash plant actually got offered as, as separate strains yeah. is he used NL one, um, to BX them for, uh, you know, he, so, so they're actually, um, you know, he never had seed lines of those. Right. So, and he lays out in like extensive detail. I can't show it to you on the screen right now, but he kind of lays out like his, like step by step, how he figured it out, yeah. what kind of yeah. phenos were going to be in it, what you could look for, um, all that type of stuff. And so that's when 88 is when a lot of, uh, 
that's when a lot of the famous stuff that we all know of really pops up. The G13 you know, hash thing. plant, I think, pops up that year. I think it, you know, it does. And then, you know, he, you know, it, it, he found some of these, some of these indica strains, these, you know, he, um, some of these indica strains were a lot more consistent than what he was working with. And so once yeah. you find consistency, you start crossing them to different things and um, you start, you know, you start getting these various hybrids sure. of such. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, and then 89, 90 is really when like he solidified the sort of the lineup as yeah. it were. And that lineup ended up staying pretty consistent um, in, in, in the seed bank catalog and even going into Sensi. Um, a lot of that stuff ended up gets, getting ported over. Yeah. So you could kind of look at it. And if you're thinking about it in that way, I would say probably by the late 80s, probably the three most consistent females that he used were um, NL5. Mm -hmm. uh, G13. Yep. And hash plant. Yep. Those were, those were sort of the three most common indicas that he would use as, as, as standard females. The hash plant. This is the PNW hash plant cutting. Still looks very similar. Uh, yeah. too. After all these really years, it still looks similar. Kind of ugly. Very uh, ugly. To be, to be perfectly honest about yeah. it. Not the, by modern standards, not particularly pretty. Not so um, and then as far as males go, by 89, 90, you would say that the the most common males he used was, like I said before, was certainly NL1. Mm -hmm. He also used NL2 a bunch. Yep. Um, you know, in, you know, he, you had um, uh, Northern Lights 5 by Northern Lights 2. Mm -hmm. You had G13 by NL2. Yeah. Um, had Northern, you had all kinds of stuff by NL1. Yeah. Uh, Hawaiian Indica was by NL1. Big Bud was by NL1. Hash Plant was by NL1. Uh, that Haze I spoke about was by NL1. Hawaiian. Uh, yeah. All that stuff. You know, I, I'll answer one quick question. I see sure. it coming on the thing. People talk about the Airborne and the Pacific G13 cuts. Uh, those are a little uh, hazy, but. Um, it's most likely they're not pure G13. They're most likely a G13 by NL2. Like that. Like that. That would right be uh, Fino popping out of the seeds that Airborne popped from. Pacific is a lot different. Um, that one that one is a lot, has a lot more of a, a cloudy history. Um, we know the breeders that offered it and stuff, but it never quite panned out the same as Airborne as far as uh, producing quality and, and stuff similar to G13. So, yeah. So, and then, um, aside from NL1 and NL2, uh, the other probably two most common males that he used by, you know, 89, 90 would have been the haze male, mm -hmm. uh, and skunk one, which haze uh, male, the haze C, haze C, haze C. Um, he, you know, the haze story, it's probably, we could probably talk about it a little bit. Yeah. If we you could want. brush up on it, brush on it, we could brush on it. So, um, so, uh, Sam Skunkman, uh, flees America and he comes over to your, he comes over to Europe and he's trying to get set up and he has, um, skunk one and haze seeds. And then from Mel Frank, he has Durban poison and Afghani one seeds. And he has a couple other, uh, seed lines that he'd collected. California from orange, over. right? California orange. orange. I think that was from Rob Clark. Oh, was that uh, from Rob? Okay. I believe so. Um, he had a number of things, um, Paul, uh, Paul, you know, he had a number of things from Rob. Rob followed yeah. him out later. Early Pearl, um, early girl. Yeah. The, the, the early girl, the, um, you know, the Pearl stuff, early Pearl, yeah. uh, some of, some of the Mexicans that, that Neville offered, uh, mm -hmm. those were from Sam initially, Yeah. but they were from, um, sourced by were, Rob, but they were from Rob. Yeah. You know, so Sam ended up coming over. Sam ended up coming over to um, to Europe first. Yeah. And he, or, he kind of brought a hodgepodge of various uh, collectors and and people's lines. Right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, 
so you know there's there's a there's a debate between um well it's not a debate anymore because neville's passed unfortunately but yeah. there was a long debate that was likely never to be solved where um sam has a number of stories about the early haze and how it happened neville has his own stories that could be an entire podcast in itself yeah. Yeah. but suffice yeah. to say that when sam came over to uh europe he sold some Hayes seeds to Neville. Uh, he sold some Hayes seeds to uh, the founder of SSSE. Um, he gave some to the uh, owner of uh, Positronics um, and maybe someone else. Maybe. Um, but there was, a, there, there was a few people, at least, at least three people are documented to have gotten um, stuff from, from Sam right when he came over, right? Yeah. I think that's been pretty well done with the haze. Yeah. With the haze. So, uh, Sam, so Neville, Neville, Neville's story, just real quick is they were a bunch of old seeds. He cracked a bunch of them. Uh, most of them did not pop. Uh, yeah. and he, the first female he got, he unfortunately killed because it never finished flowering. It took forever. It was a huge pain in the ass. He got another female, which is the B, which I spoke about, yeah. um, which I spoke about earlier as being the first actual release. And what really became famous is he got two males, which he called A and C, right? Um, and sadly, a you're kind of clipping. Your audio is clipping a little bit. It is. Yeah. It, yeah, I think so. My back. Yeah, yeah, you're there, but I mean, it's like it's hitting high points. Clip it. Clip it. Better now. There we go. It should be good. Okay, so um, he got two males, uh, A and C. They both ended up uh, becoming kind of famous. C much more so. And he 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 crossed he crossed the A to basically everything, every good indica he had. Uh, and he made a mistake with his workers in 89 and he lost the mail early. So yeah, he never, he never sold, he never sold any commercial, uh, he never sold any commercial seed of a, so everybody, yeah. everybody that, um, that gets NL five haze or any of that other kind of haze crosses, silver haze, all that it's all using the C mail. Cause that's the one that survived. Yeah. Right. Uh, and strangely, um, it seems like Neville had more success finding fire in the haze seeds that he got than other people did. Yeah, uh, that's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like. I mean, and it sounds like he had ten seeds total. Is is what it sounds like. So he, so there's debate in that, and there's yeah camp that believes that he got similar things to everyone else. Yeah, and he just had better indicas to cross them to than anybody else. Yeah, there's another camp that thinks that um neville claimed that sam sold him old seeds that he said would have a low germination rate that were from 69 to 70 mm -hmm. and maybe sam and that maybe sam when he first got there sold some original stuff before he did his open pollinations in holland and yeah. the people that got a hold of that original first batch of haze that he brought over with him got better quality haze than people did later on yeah uh, it's not really a debate that we can solve, being that it's two dudes from 1984, 1985. Yeah, right. And and they disagree, um, you know. But we do have, you know, all three guys that he that well Neville, and the, the you know the guy from SSSC mm -hmm. and the Positronics gentleman. They all agree that they got Hayes seed from Sam at then. the same time. At the same time, same year. Same time, same bag, uh, everything, all that kind of stuff. And so yeah. we know, you know, we have, we have, we have documentation from others that, that it certainly happened. Yeah. Right. And so that's when, um, by 80, by 89, 90, that's when all the famous stuff you start hearing about, which is NL5 by Skunk 1, mm -hmm. NL5 by 2, G13 by NL2. Um, you know, NL5 by, I think NL5 by Hayes was actually released via catalog, not until 18, 89, 90. Here's a, a pretty picture. And I was just looking earlier and it's NL5. It's a, I think it's a much prettier picture than on the back of a lot of the catalogs that they show where it's just like 
a jumbled up close shot of some kind of frosty leaves. This one is a much better, I think it gives a much better picture of the bud structure, overall growth patterns and whatnot. So that's really interesting uh, because that's the famous NL5 cutting. Yeah. Um, a, uh, I'll, I'll answer a quick question just because I was talking about it. Somebody just asked where's Tom Hill's haze fits in. Yes. And, uh, you know, I would say that uh, Matt knows a bit more about that than I. Mm -hmm. But I believe that Tom Hill got his haze stock from Positronics. Yeah, it's the old Positronics haze. I don't know. if I think it's the old Positronics haze 19 based on all that. So that, that's where um, Tom Hill's haze comes from one of the, uh, you know, one of the, one of the first people that gave, that gave haze to um, Positronics. Um, and let's see here. So lost my train of thought for a second answering that question. But the NL5 that he was just holding up, maybe we can talk about that for a second because yeah, it's sure. really interesting. So Neville, there's, we were talking about on the previous podcast how there was always two famous cuttings of NL5. Um, on the interview that Matt did with uh, Greg, Seattle Greg of Northern Lights fame, he said that he got a cutting of NL5, and it was from his friend Herbie, who had Steve Murphy's Afghan and crossed it to a Colombian Mexican. Yeah. And that was the cutting that he sent Neville. Neville claims he got that cut and he didn't like it very much compared to the cut that he found. Yeah. Neville's story is that he popped a bunch of NL5 seed lines because that's one of the lines he got from Greg. And most of it was an indica sativa hybrid mess. It yeah. wasn't particularly useful. But he got this one plant that was what he called the throwback plant that looked pure Afghan and had no influence of sativa whatsoever. And as you see, this short, stocky, so, dense, budded, frosty... Yeah. So that picture, I would say, leads up to um, to Neville's, you know, Neville's story being correct. Yeah. Um, and probably having some truth to it because I would look at that thing and I would not say it had any Colombian or Mexican influence. No. I, I would instantly say that looks pure Afghani. It would look like a pure Afghan. Yeah. To me, at least. So, um, you know, and... Uh, so yeah, I mean that right there, that's the famous NL5 haze. That's the famous NL5 cutting that got crossed to haze, that got crossed to skunk one, that got crossed to Northern Lights two. Um, and it's really, you know, we mentioned it before, but there was never a pure seed line of NL5 offered. There was yeah. only hybrids. Correct. Right? There was only hybrids offered. So, um, you know, uh, that's the cutting. There we go. That discusses NL5. Do you want to go into maple leaf indica, the big bud, stuff like that? Did we cover that? I don't think we covered that too, too much. So, um, we Wait one can... second. I got to do something with Murray. Go ahead and start talking. <laughs> the, uh, um, so the, so basically once he, once he found that NL5 cutting, um, like I said before, that's when he started crossing it. It became one of his standards. Yeah. You know, in in the in the situation, um, and you know he had you know like he crossed it to Skunk One. Uh, that became an extremely famous strain. Uh, mm -hmm. NL Five by Skunk One. NL Five Haze is probably the most famous line he did. Yeah. NL Five by Two is also super famous, and uh, so. You know, he NL5, G13, hash plant, those became sort of his standard indicas. Yeah. His 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 best producing females. Uh skunk one, haze, NL2, and NL1 became his most common um males. Yeah. That he used. And he offered obviously he never offered a pure NL5 line or a pure uh haze line. But he did offer pure NL1, pure NL2, pure skunk one, um, you know, that type of thing. I, I, you know, I never got to ask him why, the why of that. Why didn't you ever offer Haze, Haze pure or NL5 pure? You know, I think, I think part of the reason why he never offered uh, Haze pure is because he, he screwed up early on and he lost too much of it. Yeah. Uh, he talked about later on wishing that he could... Um, that he could 
cross the uh, that he would have been able to cross the B to the A. Yeah. And he, you know, but he he lost the B early because um, he didn't realize what he had. He lost the A on an accident, and so he sort of ended up with. Uh, he sort of ended up with not very much, but he, you know, the C was like his most consistent. Yeah. What he had, what he had left. Yeah. Um, you know, and then strangely, it seems like for whatever reason, all the other people that got A's, nothing much came of it. Yeah. No matter how much breeding or crossing they did, nothing became famous like the later Neville Hayes's. So like when I was going to, when I was going to coffee shops, uh, coffee shops were, um, you know, they were full of of C5, which is uh, NL5 Hayes C, A5, which is NL5 Hayes A, uh, AG13, which is G13 Hayes A. They, al they also had uh, G13 Hayes C. Yeah. They were full of Neville work. Yeah. Um, they didn't really carry much Posi work. They didn't carry any Sam work. They didn't carry any of those things, um, you know, even though they were easily accessible. Yeah, uh, those were standard people in Holland. So uh, there must have been a significant quality difference. Yeah, had to have been. Um, and, you know, I think even today, is there is there a famous Sam cut? Is there a famous pot? You know, it's all the stuff that they do is not uh, really. All the stuff that they do is is all the stuff that's hoarded over there. Yeah, is. Um, you know, is, uh, what you might call it, Neville cuts. Yeah. And, and, and right now I just want to take the time. If any of you older judge gentlemen are watching this and have all these cuts, give me a, give me a ring. <laughs> I'd love to just to be able to chat about them and get, and get further histories on a lot of these. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this stuff, you know, one thing that should be mentioned about this is, uh, all this stuff happened on a different continent and, you know, what uh, the story sounds pretty straightforward and simple right now, but the amount of talking and time and energy and interviewing people and trying to make sure that, like, it's not just one person's opinion and that we can get other people to back up opinions on this stuff takes a long time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. me and you have been working steady on this for, I want to say, three years now. Just me and you together. And, and, and we've done our work on our own, obviously, but like, we have been pushing hard on this. So it's taken a long time to even get up to this point to be able to say any of these things positively. Yeah. And I mean, when we say them positively, uh, most of what we're saying is generally accepted. Generally but, accepted fact for now. Like he said, if there's some old timers or whatever with some secret information out there that's not well known, most of this history is oral. Some of these old guys have beefs with one another. Some <laughs> of them don't like one another very much. Yeah. So, have their own egos and their own versions of, of history and events. Um, and so, uh, see, there's a guy right there that just said his 70 year old neighbor has had NL2 since 93. Um, if that's the case, uh, that's Matt, possible. we would love to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because there could be pockets of these things that survive. And, and the hard part, yeah, the hard part now is that for a long time, nobody gave a shit. Mm -hmm. about these uh about these strains and so yeah. the information was a little bit more verifiable because there wasn't anybody trying to claim rep or trying to claim we have this joke we call it pre-pre um where now ancient old whatever has come out of the woodwork so it, it gets a lot harder to weed through who has what yeah and like uh, i i was talking with another gentleman that we're, we're starting an interview with um and he was very important in the Dutch seat scene. And he was talking about some of his old lines possibly popping up in the U.S. And this is something that happens every few years. Someone says, I've got this stash of X, Y, Z. I've kept, you know, mason jars full of every single one and done reproduction since 80 something. And it's, it's hard unless you have extensive knowledge about these old lines and have run some. How are you ever going to tell him, no, that's not correct? It's, it's a hard situation. Yeah, I mean, there's a guy saying, you you know, there's some old school growers. Um, there's pockets in America that aren't on Instagram, that sure. aren't, aren't on, on some of these, that never got on the forums, that live in police states um, that have kept their circles quite tight. Yeah. Um, they don't, they might not even know how rare or how cool 
some of the stuff that's been within their little circle that they've just been growing and smoking on might be, sure. you know? So we still have hope. Every time a bullshit artist comes up, I'll freely admit that there's a small part of me that wishes it was true. Yeah. yeah. I, I just want it to be true. I want all the stories to be true. I want every ancient rare being imaginable to, to be accessible. Uh, yeah. yeah. Cuts and stuff like yeah. to pop up and be, um, you know, and be available to people. Sure. Um, sadly, there's a lot of people out there that are just trying to make a quick buck. Uh, and when you sell beans, I mean, think about how many people have been selling beans of uh, roadkill skunk for the last two or three years now, right? Yeah. Um, but I haven't seen any roadkill skunk flower. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to get finished flower with roadkill skunk terps. Everybody's I figuring would. that out. You know, and you can sell beans for quite some time before nobody, you know, and people, exactly it take a while before they realize that you're not finding roadkill skunk. Exactly. You can sell a lot of beans and there's people that have dropped thousands of dollars of, you know, hopes and dreams uh, and spent months hunting and they get some floral citrus skunk one. Citrus like, skunk one. Resold yeah. them skunk one. Slight, you know, slight funk, slight whatever, not roadkill, not clear skunk terps mm -hmm. um, so you know it's uh it's sad in that way um you know people were asking some other stuff and you know we got a lot to cover so we'll we'll move on a bit but to say 89 90 is when neville really established most of the strains that kind of became famous yes yeah uh, that's when they all started popping up that's when they all started popping up that's when he sort of figured out what he had what was consistent to breed with, what made sense, what lines people liked. Um, yeah. You know, he used to have this running joke that people would ask for the highest level of quality imaginable. And if he sold them an awesome indica that was a hybrid of two pure indicas and it yielded like shit, they'd bitch and bitch and moan and whine and complain because they wanted the best possible and they also wanted to crush yields. Yes. So that's always been a difficulty in, in cannabis. Um, you know, people want the best. People want the greatest terps. Uh, there's lots of people out there in commercial world that don't want to grow anything that takes longer than nine or ten weeks. Yeah. They don't want to be a pain to trim. Mm -hmm. They want it to be larfy. They don't yeah. want it to be finicky or a low feeder. Pain Massive to yielding, frosty, the highest amount of terps. Yeah. Everybody Plus twenty percent THC. I want the strongest, most potent weed you can possibly imagine with crazy yeah. perps, and I want donkey dick buds, and I want it done in 50 days. Yeah. Then day. Yeah. But, you know, rarely does that occur. Yeah. Same package, sadly. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the famous strains that we all smoke um, from a production standpoint are annoying. Yeah. Very much so, especially the last decade or so. It's gotten yeah. worse. Nobody would ever pick to grow cookies. No. Uh, nobody would ever pick to grow kush where it's like dink, 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 yeah. dink, nugs here and there. They don't hold themselves up. I mean, if you were like a commercial farmer in the real world, um, you know, they'd be looking for some kind of like green crack, blue dream type structure, sure. solid top to bottom buds, easy to grow, fairly fast finishing. You know, that's what from a production standpoint, uh, and, a, and a happiness standpoint, that's what you want. Yeah. But, you know, um, even sour diesel, you know, that yields yeah. pretty well, takes a long time, kind of feathery, makes a lot of bee buds. If you mess yep. it up, it can be really larfy, um, you know, <laughs> super tasty and it works really good. Yeah. It burns really nice, but it's not Blue Dream. No, it's not. It's not, you know, very white or something like that. It's not something that that's just covered in nugs. And so, um, so yeah, so uh, the uh, uh, maybe we should talk about. So he created all this stuff. Neville was the largest. There was really only two. You know, there's other people that will claim to have seed banks. Yeah, Sensi Seeds had a tiny seed bank. Positronics had a small seed bank. There was other seed banks in Holland, but there was really only two seed. And this is really why we're spending so much time talking about it. Is in the 80s there was really only two seed banks that were selling a lot of seed in America. In, in Amsterdam, in, it's selling to America. Correct. And, that, they, and they were the first two seed banks that really offered worldwide sales to anybody that was willing to come to Holland and buy them or yeah. fill out their, their mail order sheet and send them an envelope with some money and a list. 
Yep. And that was Super Sativa Seed Club uh, and the Seed Bank, which was Neville. Yes. Sativa Seed Club uh, started a little bit after Neville. Um, it had similar things to him. It had some of their own stuff. Um, but Neville was the, he was the elephant. He was the big dog. He was, yeah. the, he was the, he was the one selling the vast majority of stuff that people in America were buying from Holland was Neville's. Yes. And that really, that's really what makes him so important because <clears throat> the, uh, the seed game is super diversified now, right? Yeah. He basically almost had a monopoly. Yeah. And it's why all, all these strains that are around today usually have something of Neville's in it. If and, not both sides. Yeah. And so that there's a lot of, there's a lot of Neville work in a lot of modern strains. Yeah. Um, simply because he was the only game and he was one of the only games in town and tons and tons of people got his stuff and then they bred his stuff into stuff they already had in America. Yeah. And so his stuff got blended in and, you know, his stuff got super famous. Obviously the NL5 Haze <clears throat> became a phenomenon in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, it started being it started being sold you know they call it the heist haze you know the piff the church the this the that the whatever yeah. it Frank got a massive a massive thing. um and the super skunk uh you know became super famous uh as well yeah. um, he's talked about how super skunk and nl5 haze were his two top selling varieties yeah uh, you know and so enormous amounts of those seeds got sold Right. Yeah. And that's sort of what uh, maybe we can talk. So the 90 catalog is the final catalog of Neville's ownership of the seed bank. Yeah. I don't think I have that one here. Um, and that there's a couple there's there, the most famous thing that came out of the 90 catalog was he released um, Super Skunk. Yes. Uh, Super Skunk was, you know, when sadly uh sam did not like skunk he didn't well you got to say he sam liked skunk one he did not like skunk smells he didn't like skunk aroma yeah so aroma he, he took go. skunk one and he tried to breed the skunk out of it that is by his own quote right yes he yeah. did he has yeah. his own quote he was going for more of the citrus grapes sweet floral he liked those aromas. He was going for bud structure and other things. Yeah. He didn't like the rank skunk. He tried to, uh, this, so, so I'll answer another question. The silver pearl came out as a, as a single strain, I think in the last two years of the seed bank, uh, 88, 89 and 90. Yeah. He offered silver pearl and I, I quote me on the, on silver pearl. It's, uh, it's, uh, Early it's, pearl something. I think it's, I think it's, early pearl it might be nl5 early pearl skunk one something along those lines something like that yeah 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 uh let's see i only see early pearl improved in this one and it doesn't list anything but yeah they, it's something like that it's something like that and he also yeah. released uh silver pearl by haze in yep. those couple of years which was called silver haze uh at the time uh he yep. called it he called it silver pearl by haze yeah, um, it got shortened to silver, silver haze at Sensi. So he, um, you know, there was a guy named Jim Ortega that we'll talk about real briefly. Mm -hmm. And um, Jim Ortega, he traded with Jim, gave him Kush for garlic bud, um, uh, maple leaf indica, and Hawaiian indica. Yeah, he offered Hawaiian indica. Um, by NL1 in the last couple of years of his catalog, maybe mm -hmm. like three years of his catalog, he offered a uh, maple leaf, um, a pure. Yes. Called it maple, uh, a, a, a Afghan breeder packs, I think, mm -hmm. uh, where you could literally buy um, some of the original seed stock that Jim Ortega gave him. You know? How amazing would that have been? Yeah. I mean, and he, um, and he offered garlic bud as a pure strain. Uh, the only thing that never really got offered is a pure that never really got messed with too much was Kush Four. Yeah, uh, there is a thing he sold called Kush by Kush, which Kush he said Kush. Kush by Kush, which he said he crossed his two best Kushes to, um, you know, uh, to each other, and his two best Kushes were Kush Four and NL Two. Do you know what so, year that one's in? I was trying to show it, but I, I can't find it. 
I'm gonna say that one's an. Oh, here it is. That one might. That one might be an 87. Yeah, here's at least one of them in the 89. Talking about it, I don't know how clear it is. And he also offered Skunk Kush, which yep. was and so that's that's you know and then uh, um, so maybe we're getting pretty in depth here, but yeah, uh, maybe we we, maybe we should talk about um, his fame led to issues, right? Yes, so let's sell, get into that. He's selling millions of dollars in seed to America. Yeah. Right? It's the Reagan era, and then the George Bush era. It's the height of the war on drugs, large penalties, weeds totally illegal everywhere. Um, and there was a situation in which a um, a hydro store got raided um, from whatever reason, some kind mm -hmm. some kind of action, and they discovered that this guy was supplying a bunch of growers, and in that they found money and Neville's catalogs. And they realized that uh, they realized that he was selling dollars in seed um, to America. And you, you notice in some of these back catalogs, it always says that it's shipped from the U.S. Or like in the High Times uh, ads for Neville's things, it would always say shipped from U.S. Well, what's interesting about that is this isn't factual, but I believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. It's that Neville, I think, had partners that he smuggled seeds in to America. Yeah. And then you would send Neville money mm -hmm. and then he would communicate what you needed and they would yep. ship the seeds from within the U.S. Yeah, I think he was pretty, um, he, he was transparent about that when it was going on. And so as a result of that, that meant that every seed batch didn't have to go through customs. Yes. He just had to get it through customs occasionally and then he could sell it within the United States. Well, yeah. as you can imagine, uh, the DEA and the government at the time took a pretty uh, poor view of that aspect. Yeah. Right. And so um, Operation Green Merchant happens where they decide to raid um, everyone, every grow store in the United, for, for the most part, they raided yeah. the grow stores in the United States. They did a big push. Right. And uh, Neville gets caught, I believe, in Australia. Yep. And he gets busted. Okay. Uh, and he ends up spending a good amount of time in jail. Better part of a year. Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, we're not going to, this 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 particular episode, we're not going to talk very much about SSSC. Because yeah. we're going to save that for a different time. Um, but what that did is that sort of... Uh, um, Led to a domino effect of sorts. It, it had a domino effect of sorts. Uh, uh, Super Sativa Seed Club decided to stop um, because they saw what was going on with Neville, and it was pretty serious. Neville was already in, was obviously in jail, and uh, this gave an opportunity for others, yeah, who had seen how how Neville and the Super Sativa Seed Club were doing. Mm -hmm. Right, it left a void in Amsterdam. Uh, in Holland, it was still it was legal at that time, obviously, to produce seed for um, to produce seed. Yeah, it was the only places in in the world where it was totally legal to produce cannabis seed. Yeah. So uh, Neville was sitting in jail. Um, he was fighting extradition. They didn't want to extradite Neville to America mm -hmm. because um, they wanted to put him in jail for life in prison. Yeah. And Australia and Holland, which he was a citizen of both, didn't agree with that. Yeah. So he was stuck in jail. Uh, and he, um, you know, there was all of a sudden there was no seed banks. Yeah. There was no seed banks left. It caused Massive a bunch of, point. it caused a bunch of ripple effects. Uh, a whole bunch of growers in America got busted um, to their relationships with various uh, hydro stores and stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, Greg, Seattle, Greg talked in his interview with Matt about how by the late eighties and that era, they had basically lost everything because of a series of rolling busts. Yeah. Uh, there was heavy presence. They were really going after people, electricity, all this kind of stuff. And so, um, Sensi, which was founded by Ben and Alan Dronkers, they saw an opportunity and they offered to bail Neville out of jail. 
and uh, give him money to help him fight his situation as long as he sold them their company. Yes. And that was the invention of Sensi. So creation. That, that was the death of the seed bank. The seed bank. Yeah. And Sensi, uh, Sensi absorbed him and all of a sudden went from a nobody to the biggest game in town. That's right. Um, and they bought uh, they they bought his seed bank, right? Yeah. So all of a sudden they start offering, um, you know, and we actually the Sensi ninety one seed bank catalog is one of the rarest catalogs um, because it only was out for it was obviously only out for one year, and it shows the merger of the seed bank with Sensi, and they have a much much more limited catalog than what they offered in the future. And a much more limited one than Neville was currently offering, but by the time he split. So, um, yeah. And so as a result of that, uh, sadly for Neville, Neville went from being the owner of the largest, most successful seed bank in the world mm -hmm. to the head breeder of Sensi. Yeah. He lost his company. He lost his self-control. Mm -hmm. uh, the government hated him. Yeah. Uh, and he was trapped in Holland for a long time because the the America wanted to come steal him yeah. and extradite him to America and have him face charges of life in prison for seed sales. Yes. Holland refused to extradite him because since seed sales were legal and he was a citizen of Holland, mm -hmm. they were not going to extradite one of their citizens for doing something that was legal in their own country. Yeah. And for him to go to life in prison in some other country. In some other country, he is not a citizen of. Yeah. In some other country, he's not a citizen of. So yeah. he had his freedom, but he was stuck in Holland. The DEA and Interpol was after his ass. Yeah. And he lost the biggest, most, most uh, famous seed company and had to give it to Ben and Alan Dronkers and work for them. Yeah. And he, didn't he lose the castle as well at that point? Yeah, he lost the castle. Um, there was a number of projects he had that when he was in jail, mm -hmm. never saw the light of day. Yeah. He was planning on releasing a uh, NL5 seed line in 90, in 91. Yep. Um, he had taken the NL5 cutting that Matt showed earlier, and he had BX'd it like eight times. Yeah. Um, he used NL1, like I said, with everything. Uh, he BX'd it eight times. And he was planning on releasing it in um, 1991, and it disappeared. Yeah. That project disappeared. It never got released again. And so there was some things. Uh, somebody asked if they could see it again. Which um, one? The NL5? The NL5. Yep. Yeah. There we go. So, yeah. After. So, so obviously that sucked for Neville uh, spending a good 10 months in jail is no fun. Jail food's no fun being in, 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 you know, concrete jungle. It's no fun. Losing um, your company's no fun. Yeah. Your company's no, I mean, yeah, it's like basically they were like, Hey, we'll do you a solid. We'll get you out of jail and we'll get you back to Holland, but we want your shit. Yeah. But by a minor competitor at that, someone that wasn't even close to the level. He since he wasn't even close to where Super Sativa C Club or the exactly. Bay, they yeah. were nobody compared yeah. to them. And so you're sitting in jail, and your options are keep sitting in jail, or have these sort of uh, uh, greasy Dutch businessmen uh, offer to get you out and get you home and give you some money and buy your company. Yeah, it sounds real good at the time. Sure. So, you know, he chose the get out of jail. Yeah you know, uh, card, but then he lost control. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was sort of the start of, you know, by the time that, uh, Matt, Matt can speak to this a little bit. He got to communicate quite a bit with Neville. I, I got to meet yeah. Neville a few times. Uh, I've chatted with him a number of times. Matt had a much longer back and forth with him, uh, much later in his career. That sounded uh, super dirty. <laughs> and uh, well, I just mean that, you know, they, no, I know what you meant. They, they communicated a lot more over a lot more months, a lot more directly. Yeah. 
then, you know, I met him through other people. I used to go to Holland quite a bit to get seeds and I ended up meeting him a few times. I was a young guy. guy. It's not like I had some kind of, uh, you know, massive uh, information dump from Neville to myself. You yeah. know, I, yeah. was, I wasn't interviewing him or anything like that. I was a little shell shocked uh, yeah. meeting somebody like that. So, um, but, you know, Matt can attest that uh, that was sort of the start of Neville's bitterness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, things Neville paid more of a price than most. Yeah, he did. He or, did. Uh, spreading seeds for overgrowing the government for that kind of thing. Um, and if he you also look at felt like he was owed the most for doing this. And so, you know, he felt like most people lived off the back of his work. Yeah. And, and it's not necessarily incorrect. And he, he but never, he got, yeah, he never got, um, he never, he never got to reap the benefits yes. as much. Um, of, of his work as other people did. Um, his life got burned down on any number of different occasions. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it should be said, you know, this is kind of a personal part, not, um, not, uh, it's not the greatest thing to talk about with Neville, but he was a heroin addict. Yeah. Uh, that's actually the reason why he went from Australia to Holland was, uh, you know, you know, he was getting, he was, uh, heavily addicted in the early eighties, uh, he was getting treatment. Um, and so I'm sure, um, that some of his life issues were certainly self-inflicted Sure. Uh, because when you struggle with addiction like that, your life is, um, your, your life is tough. Tell you know, me about it. You have, <laughs> you have, you have ups and downs, sure. you know, uh, you have issues, you know, you, he probably wasn't the easiest person to deal with. He probably had moods. Mood, uh, major mood swings, sure. Major mood swings, you know, better days than others, better months than others type of thing. Um, you know, and then on top of that, like, you know, a lot of times really talented people, um, sometimes they're pain in the ass. Yeah. You Highly know, intelligent so, people, talented people can be very hard to communicate with. Sure. Um, but what I will say about Neville that was different than most people is that most Dutch, which is some, which is different than a little bit in America. Certainly there's lots of people in America. that are just like this. Yeah. But, um, in, he was probably one of the only Dutch that really loved the plant and really did things as far as the famous Dutch. I'm not like yeah. making a big general statement about everybody, yeah, but of course. As, as, as far as like the, you know, the, the Dutch are pretty famous for being extremely business oriented. Correct. And they'll, they'll tell you the truth as much as it helps their bottom line. Yeah. And if it doesn't help their bottom line, they could give a shit. Yeah. So Neville was extremely open about lines and strains and what he used and how he did it, and what he did it with and where he got it from. Yeah. There's nobody in the Dutch scene that we know more about who he got strains from. And, and what he did to create strains, all everything. Yeah. A lot of other seed banks in Holland. It's a mystery. Mm -hmm. They have zero interest in telling you. Yeah. They've had decades to tell you they don't care. Yeah. There are a few that might be popping up that, that, uh, are, are, yeah. are, are pretty interesting. That's why I, I wanted to make a qualifier because he's by no means is the only one. Yeah. But there are plenty of, you know, and that's the sad thing is that, um, you know, Ben, uh, the drunkers are still alive. Correct. Yeah. But they're a terrible interview. Yeah. And they don't care about history. No, that's not their interest at all. They will tell you to this day that they have every original plant known to man. Mm -hmm. They breed with all the same plants. They still make their own seeds. They still make their own seeds, even though it's been verified by any number of different sources that they outsourced it to Spain some time ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that they lost a lot of plants. Um, but you can't get actual history out of them. Correct, yeah. They don't it's, care. It's hard. Neville, Neville cared while he had the seed bank. He gave a bunch of information. He was honest about when he lost certain strains. Mm -hmm. Popped up on Mr. Nice a uh, long time later in like 09, uh, 10, 11 era. Mm -hmm. He answered a lot of questions pretty directly. Yeah. Um, the Dronkers and Sensi are a black hole. Yeah. They don't tell you shit. Major black hole. They don't care. And I don't know that they even know shit to tell. Um, they Some, obviously, they do, and they were a part of. But I don't yeah. know that they would have any kind of knowledge about any of the breeding going on at Sensi. 
And so, you know, this is, um, so, so that's kind of, I guess we kind of segued into Sensi. Yeah. So we're headed into Sensi. We're headed into Sensi. So Neville, you know, Neville had the seed bank, most famous seed bank, created a lot of the most famous strains, gets busted, spends a bunch of time in jail, gets bailed out, loses his company. Now he's head breeder at Sensi. Yeah. Um, and so it took some time to transition. Yeah. So Matt and I have spent a bunch of time analyzing this. And um, I don't know the best way to put it, but Sensi, there was certain famous things like NL5 Haze and uh, Super Skunk that they left alone because yeah. the name already had such great uh, that's that. Uh, it had already been marketed under that name and was already so successful that they didn't have a need to change. There's actually some pretty good comments happening. I'll, I'll get to them in a minute. Maybe we can even like, shit. You can't see stuff. So, um, so anyway, well, this is this is super long winded, but it is pretty important. And the reason why it's so important is that the a lot, a lot, a lot of our famous strains and our named elite cuts from the 90s and a lot of the things that went into the famous cuts that we all work with today came directly from Neville's work. Yeah. Because he was the biggest game in town. Um, probably from 1985 to the late 90s, um, he was the biggest force in cannabis. And so as a result of that, the, the tons of people in America were getting his seeds and, um, and okay. So there's, there's stuff coming in that people are saying that's actually pretty cool. So we'll start chatting about that. Okay. So, uh, so since buys the seed bank and they, in my opinion, they wanted to obscure exactly how much of the seed bank they had taken. Yeah. And they wanted to trade. So, like I said, Super Skunk, NL5 Haze, some of the stuff that was super famous already, they left alone. But they were the first company to start trademarking names in cannabis, which still goes on today and sucks. Yeah. Uh, there's still battles going on <clears throat> about, about that. And so uh, the, I see some stuff. People are talking about early Shiva Shanti had garlic butt in it. Anyone remember the early Shiva Shanti that threw garlic phenos? Uh, that type. I of have thing. one of the catalogs that actually talks about that specifically. That very first catalog, where so, they're talking. Remember, I was just reading it to you. Yeah, so that's pretty funny in the sense that my opinion is is that Shiva Shanti is garlic bud. Yeah, uh, one of them is. One, one of them it, at one point was garlic bud for sure. And so I'll try not to get too deep into it because it's kind of a it's it's kind of a nerdy subject. But if you look at the seed bank catalogs and you look at the Sensi catalogs, um. Sensi ended up using a lot of Neville's stock photos and yes. a lot of his verbiage and his descriptions, just much shorter versions of them in his yeah. catalog. Um, so uh, they, Shiva, Garlic Bud disappears. Yes. But it becomes Shiva Shanti. Shiva Shanti 1, and it sounds like a uh, hybrid of becomes Shiva Shanti 2. Right. And so they use the same, they use a lot of the same verbiage in describing Shiva Shanti as Neville's descriptions of garlic bud. And the same picture. They use the exact same photo. Okay. Um, another one that we could talk about is NL5 Skunk 1 becomes, yeah. becomes uh, Shiva Skunk. Yeah. And that's actually the only one that they change the name that in the Sensi description, they actually say it's actually NL5 Skunk 1. Yeah. But they, they took, still leave that in the description. They, it's literally in the description. They took it from NL5 Skunk 1. They called it Shiva. They called it Shiva. Yeah. This is something that people will probably find extremely interesting. Um, or maybe maybe not. But uh, <laughs> so Neville's NL2 F3, he always referred to going back early as the NL2. Any description you can find in the seed bank catalog of any hybrids he made, not only does he call it NL2, but he always calls it a Hindu Kush type. Yeah. So when Northern Lights gets ported over from the seed bank, Northern Lights 1, F3, becomes clean Northern Lights. Yeah. Right? Um, and you can actually tell because they, in, in the Sensi catalog, they list Northern Lights as a three-time Indica winner. Yeah. 
88, 89, 90. And you can look it up. And NL1 was the Indica winner in 88, 89, 90. Yeah. And the little NL2, tail. NL2 becomes Hindu Kush. Yes. So since he changed the name uh, and, and NL2 used the same picture, they use similar descriptions. You can go back um, even, even straight up in certain stuff. Like they, they sold a skunk Kush. Yeah. And they called it skunk one by their best Hindu Kush. Yeah. Neville sells a skunk Kush at the seed bank and he calls it NL2 by skunk one. Yeah. They call it the same name. They have the same description, except for they just call it Hindu Kush. Yeah. Right. So NL2 doesn't disappear. It just gets a different name. Yeah. It's absorbed another differently. NL2 is that there was another seed company that stole NL2 and they sold NL2. It was Dutch Passion. Yeah. And they sold NL2 under the name Oasis. And then um, Adam Dumb, I think his name is, he sold one as Closet Queen that was also an NL2. Pure NL2. So, so NL2 sort of drops off as a name, but it lives on in other names. And that's yeah. sort of the start of uh, that's sort of the start of um, the rename game. Yeah. This is all the real early rename game. So I'll just read off some renames from for yeah, you guys. Yeah, let's, let's hear the renames. Uh, I, got, I got to look away at the camera so I can actually like see this little chart I got going on. But okay. Neville called it Silver Pearl by Hayes. Uh, Sensi calls it Silver Haze. Yeah. Um, Garlic Bud becomes Shiva Shanti. Uh, like, like I just said, NL1 becomes Northern Lights. NL2 becomes Hindu Kush. Big Skunk, which was Big Bud by Skunk 1 at the sea yeah. back, simply becomes Sensi Skunk. That's right. Hash Plant by NL1 by Swazi becomes African Queen. That's my other nickname that, that a lot of people call me. African Queen, Big Bud by NL1 simply becomes Big Bud. Hawaiian Indica by NL1 simply becomes Hawaiian Indica. Yep. Um, it was really only a few of the most famous, like Skunk One, uh, you know, NL5 Haze, Super Skunk, that uh, that kept the name. Yeah. They changed everything else, but they left us clues because they were fucking lazy. Yeah, out of laziness, pure laziness. They use the same pictures, and they use a lot of the same verbiage. Yeah, and they even kept the same yields and harvest harvest times and other data that Neville included. Yeah. Um. So they made it. So they made it. Uh. And then they trademarked those things. Yes. So then all of a sudden they own the trademarks. Yep. Right. Um. Let's see where. Where's a good segue from that? Um, I can't even bring up my notes. <laughs> no, fine. You know, you, you're right. So Shiva, like I said, Shiva Shanti, it is garlic bud. Yeah. It, us, it uses the same verbiage in the description. It uses the exact same photo from yep. Neville catalogs. It is. It is you know? the garlic bud. I had that pulled out earlier just to show to the, the two side by side, but I can't remember where I put it. It's yeah, we don't I mean it's it's yeah. it's we could we could uh we could go we could go in depth. I'm trying to keep it relatively brief, but the point is is that <clears throat> since he was trying to obscure just how much they went from a little company that had barely anything, yeah, to the biggest company in Holland. Um the biggest company in Holland and um the timeline we're talking right now, this is 1991. Yeah. Uh, this is this is early to mid nineties. Mister Nice is. I'm just answering a question. Mister Nice is way way later. We probably won't even get to that part of cannabis today because that didn't yeah. start early two thousands. Yeah. So Neville's working as the head breeder for um, for Sensi, and we're not going to talk about these companies very much. But it's probably good to mention that ne Neville not only spawned Sensi seeds. But everybody working for Neville got their own ideas, and he spawned a lot. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, – um, well, yeah, somebody just posted Shiva Shanti is not garlic now. Uh, it was sweet. We'll, we'll get to why things aren't the way they are anymore. Yeah. Uh, but 
Adam Dunn from TH Seeds. Um, uh, Is that how you pronounce his last name? Who knows? Adam. Adam from TH Seeds. Uh, Simon who is famous for serious seeds. Yeah. Tony, who ended up making Sag Martha, they all worked at Sensi under Neville. Yeah. And they, after leaving, uh, Tony and Simon started Cerebral Seeds in 1994 for one year. And then split, Tony made Sag Martha, uh, Simon made um, Sirius, and, um, you know, and... Uh, uh, let's see. And Adam, like I said, made THC. Yeah. So, um, you know, so Neville working with Neville, you know, uh, Neville sort of put all four of those companies on the map. Yep. I, those companies would have existed if they hadn't been able to work either for Neville under Neville, uh, since he bought Neville. Um, so, you know, and I think that for most of Neville's time at Sensi. He was breeding and doing a bunch of projects, but uh, you look at the catalogs that come out from those '90s, from those early to mid '90s periods, and it's basically the seed bank catalog. Yeah, basically. Uh, you know, there was a few things that Neville got rid of in, at the later era of the seed bank, like he didn't really like Afghani One. Yeah, um, he sold it for the first few years of the seed bank, and then he and then he eliminated it since he brought it back. Um, there was a couple other strains that uh, that popped up here and there, but for the most part, um, Sensi was the seed bank continued, and uh, they they absorbed all of his history. You know, they started claiming they were from '85. They started, oh, yeah. the originator of all these various strains. Mm -hmm. They sort of like you know, since they bought it, they bought all the history too, um, and all that. And so Neville was working for some uh, some Dutch businessmen that he didn't really like. Yeah. That's how it ends up. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so he worked for Sensi, and we can since, since nothing much changed from the seed bank to Sensi, um, we don't really have to talk a, a bunch about that, except for. Uh, you know, I started going to Amsterdam in uh, 1994. Mm -hmm. There's some very famous people on IG and stuff that started going in the early 90s and mid 90s and stuff. And Sensi was one of the primary places where we got things. Yeah. So, you know, um, Sensi was really Neville. Yeah. It was all his stuff. He was their head breeder still. Um, and, uh, you know, and so... You know, Neville from, you know, 85 to 90 at the Seed Bank and then from 91 to 95 at Sensi, um, you know, a, a massive amount of Super Skunk and NL5 Haze, all the NL5 Haze you know of, the Cuban Black, the Piff, the Heights Haze, the various, the Miami, that all came from that era yeah. of, uh, you know, NL5 Haze Seed. Um, and he... Uh, you know, they lost the G13 cutting by Neville's own admission in about 93. It was one of the ones that got sick and died early. Yeah. Lost the NL5 haze cutting um, in 94, 95. It's one of the reasons why all the best phenos of NL5 haze in, um, and in uh, uh, America were found sort of between 89 and 95. Yeah. Um, and then once the once the mom was lost, uh, people didn't really find the same quality. I don't think I think all the named elites of NL5 Haze, of which there's probably eight or twelve. Yeah, there's a lot. Of they all come from that six year period. Yeah. I don't think there's any that come later than that. I doubt it. You know? I haven't seen any good NL5 Haze cuttings in a long time. They you know? didn't come from that era. And so um you know, uh, so well, maybe we'll tie a bow on the Sensi thing because we've we've kind of covered most of it. Yeah. By the uh, the last famous thing that never Neville did there was he was working on this hybrid, um, which was NL5 Haze, uh, or 
people call it C5 now. It's still alive. He had this he had very famous mother cut that was sold in all the coffee shops. It was one of the two of his two favorite C5 cuttings. <clears throat> um, and he was trying to play around and make a poly hybrid. And he was playing with crossing it to skunk haze. Yeah. And he wasn't really happy with where it was yet. But Ben and Alan Dronkers being uh, uh, businessmen, they had spent a bunch of money and they were sponsoring the 95 Cannabis Cup. And the Cannabis Cup was all about Jack Herrera. And it was all about his life and his history and his contributions to cannabis. And so Ben went to Neville and said, hey, we want to release a Jack Herrera. Yep. I have something that we drop at the Cannabis Cup. Wouldn't that be a great marketing tool? Yeah. He's the number one sponsor of this cup. We're spending a bunch of money. It's all about Jack. How about we release? Jack? Yeah. And so it was ready um, as far as Neville was concerned, but he released NL5 Haze by Skunk Haze and they called it Jack Herrera. Yeah. I doubt we need to spend very much time talking about Jack Herrera uh, because it's super famous. Jack. It's Jack. Jack. <laughs> but, uh, it led to Cindy 99. You know, it led yeah. to a whole bunch. It was big yielding. It was fast. It was chunky. It was a trimmer's dream. Uh, it was, it smelled like uh, terpenaline. <laughs> uh, it's, it, people have a, a, a love and hate. Uh, a lot of people have dislike for that aroma. The Jack aroma became infamous. Yeah. For, uh, you know, being something that repelled people. Yep. You know, and stuff like Jack Terps. And some of yep, Jack Terps. Jack. Yeah. People know, genuinely know what, genuinely speaking, know what, uh, or generally yeah. speaking, know what Jack Terps are. I, I think the first time that people ever heard about the word terpenaline long before that terp was identified, is yeah. people called it Jack Terps. Yep. Jack Terps. Jack, Jack was a super high yielding. Uh, you know, strain. A lot of people grew it, and that was people's first experience with extreme terpenaline. Um, and it it bred dominant. Yeah, very. Uh, Matt can talk about trying to get interesting phenos out of terpenaline dominant strains that yeah. don't give you terpenaline. It's pretty tough. It is very tough to to breed with terpenaline anything and try to infuse yeah. that into a lot. Jack, Jack terps, train wreck terps. Yep. Uh, a lot of breeders have have thrown their hat in the ring and tried to breed with it a lot because it's such a vigorous, powerful, high yielding, fun plant. Yeah, and it's real hard to find a not terpenaline dominant pheno that works. I think um, in in modern times, though, people are, are finding out that terpenaline is actually really good in extracts. It makes them very flavorful. So there's been a little bit of a renaissance for the terpenaline queens out there. So maybe, um, maybe since you can't see anything, maybe we'll pause. You want to answer some questions? Yeah, you, go ahead and, and figure out what uh, questions we need to answer and let's do it. So the number one voted thing, and we talked about it a little, was why was Sam's never able to produce a haze to rival Neville's? What was the outstanding difference? That's the number one biggest question. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you, you, you've uh, answered this before when I was talking with you about it, so go ahead. Um, I actually think I mentioned it mostly a little earlier in the program, but um, we don't know why Sam, you know, Sam sold Hayes to Positronics. If you bought Hayes from the Flying Dutchman, that was Sam's Hayes. He mm -hmm. sold loads of wholesale seed to any number of brokers in Holland, and then they sold it through their seed banks. And for whatever reason... Uh, everybody in Holland wanted Neville's haze hybrids and nobody found anything that rivaled what Neville was able to find. Um, you know, and a lot of times, uh, Caleb, uh, CSI, myself, Matt, others, we always talk about like the proof is in the plants. Yeah. You know, people lie, plants don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, and for whatever reason, maybe it was sheer luck. Uh, maybe it was Neville's story is true and he did get earlier haze than, than Sam produced later. Maybe Sam has, has been open, which is something that I found um, 
which is I found uh, uh, hard to believe, to be honest, as a breeder, is he loves Hayes to do and uh, he never ever made any selections, and he just he just said all I did was open pollinate it to keep it as wide as possible for thirty years. Yeah, he didn't do any selection work, any line work on it. I as a as a breeder never ever playing around with your favorite phenos from your favorite line seems really unusual to me yeah yeah it is uh, odd. it's like me never fucking with blueberry you know yeah but huh? but that's what sam says he yeah. and, and it's also possible so we could talk about this for a second sometimes when you open pollinate that's great because you open it up wider mm -hmm. but that means it might be a hell of a lot more effort to a dig lot more effort stuff that you want yeah. and so and by repeatedly open pollinating it and never making any selections um he might have open pollinated his way into jungle weed or hemp or he might have lost a bunch of the quality that led people to love haze in the first place well you look at um like tom hill's haze um he would even say you need at least 10 packs you know 100 seeds to find a single keeper so the 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 repeatedly OPing probably didn't help anything because obviously there's so many phenotypes even in positronics haze that's been worked. There's so many phenotypes that you need to pop a hundred to find a single one. Yeah, I mean Sam has claimed that everyone got the exact same haze and no one got any different. Yeah, I find that a bit hard to believe <clears throat> because there's lots of people that bought Flying Dutchman haze. There's lots of people that bought Posy haze. There's tons of people that bought uh, Tom Hill haze. Uh, Hayes has been sold for decades in a yeah. wide variety of places. And all the elites that people hoard come from Neville's stuff. Yeah. For whatever reason. Yeah. And you would think that we have a lot of quality Afghans out there, and you'd be able to cross some pure Hayes to some other good Afghans mm -hmm. and get all the results to Neville. Um, but the G13 haze and the NL5 haze and so on and so forth, no one's been able to replicate. Yep. Those ones are better. And, and Neville did also have the uh, theory that he talked about much later on, that he only believed in breeding with haze males, that that was the key to finding the, 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 the Holy Grail haze was through haze males breeding and not using them as females. You know, some of that might be that he lost the two best phenos of females in the yeah, 80s. There could be some of it. Yeah. That's what he ended up doing. I would also say, too, that collecting pollen from some 18 or 20 week haze male and then dusting it on uh, other plants when appropriate is probably a lot easier of a breeder uh, aspect than trying to wait for an 18 or 20 week female to be the appropriate time to pollinate it. That's a good point. So there's something to be said for the fact that you could collect a bunch of pollen and then dump it on stuff later. And yeah. it's be much harder to breed with the girls. Yeah. So um, there's another question. Me and Gene recently mentioned that you and he have been doing some research and it looked like Hindu Kush could most likely be a renamed NL. I think we chatted about that already at length. Yeah. I, I definitely believe that the Hindu Kush that was sold at Sensi is just NL2. Yeah. Um, have I had any dealings with Gypsy? Nope. <laughs> I, not. I, I almost did. And, um, and it, it was just a really bad proposal for me to front a bunch of seeds. He said that he would sit on the money for, I want to say six months to a year, at which point he would pay you out mostly in credit store credit so you would wait like almost a year to be able to use anything from anything it was stupid it was no way in fucking hell well we'll have podcasts that deal with gypsies era of seed banks at some other time <laughs> uh, maybe not necessarily a ton of him specifically but he's from a yeah. different era than we're discussing today sure 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 um outside of the work that neville brought to the world who outside the original big names contributed most new strains worth something to the culture early on that's a pretty good question. See, I, yeah, I, it is. I've mentioned some of it before. Um, I'll just associate some names with strains. Uh, Sam Skunkman brought uh, Hayes and Skunk One to Europe uh, mm -hmm. or popularized it to people. Uh, Jim Ortega, who's a very mysterious character, 
broth, Hawaiian indica, garlic bud, uh, maple leaf indica, and Kush 4 to Neville. Those were all used extensively in projects and so became very famous building blocks. Uh, Mel Frank, uh, who's still quite well known, yep. uh, he contributed the Afghani 1 and the Durban Poison to things. Uh, I don't know if Jorge Cervantes... Uh, I don't think he directly contributed anything, but he did make the links. He, he certainly connected Neville yeah. with... Um, uh, growers in Oregon and Washington that led to the hash plant in G13, which obviously entered into a pretty legendary status. Um, Rob Clark, who wrote Marijuana Botany, uh, Hashish, and some other really important cannabis books. He contributed a bunch of, um, you know, California orange, um, various Mexicans, various sativa crosses. Uh, he certainly brought early girl, early pearl yeah. that type of stuff. That's all credited to him. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, that's sort of those that those names right there are sort of the backbone. And the um, NL guys, yeah. The Seattle Greg, certainly. Yeah. Uh, NL and the NL group from the Pacific Northwest. They contributed, obviously, all the NL lines. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's a number of people we don't know who they are, but those guys are sort of the foundational um, people that brought a lot of stuff that ended up not only getting brought over there, but ended up getting used a lot yeah. and into a lot. And, and Don Downs for NL2 specifically. I believe yeah. that was his. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a guy named Herbie that contributed the NL5. Um, you know, I'm sure behind all these famous names are just like a lot of things. There's probably a group of people uh, or good friends and stuff that contributed various things that their names have been lost to time. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I, if not so dog and Matt could turn back time, what packs would you buy? Uh, well, you know, uh, I would buy everything from the seed bank. Everything, literally everything you could. I yeah. would buy hundreds of seeds of everything that I could. All the Durban, all the Skunk One, all the NL5 Haze, the, app, the Maple Leaf Mix. Um, a lot of these things we talk about, um, but... You know, Neville was one of the few people that got to run through hundreds or thousands of even of these seeds and really see what was in there. Mm -hmm. We talk about the famous phenos, but, um, you know, uh, we were really young when these things were out there. I was uh, like six. So I was, I'm a little older than you, but even yeah. still, like I said, I was I was only 18 in 1994 when I started yeah. going. So. I was even sort of catching the tail end of certain things. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There, the next question was Afghan tea. What's known about it? The strains it was used in. Geographically, what part of Afghanistan did it come from? Via who, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't know I'm where gonna, it came I'm going to preface this. I'm going to preface this. All these people, all these people talking about roadkill skunk and all the other stuff. I sincerely believe, and, and just from the work with um, even the heirloom Afghani, the uh, later Sours, the fucking super skunk and Jeezel, all that, I sincerely believe that's the direction of work. There are all these people chasing different directions. I think it's fair to, to put it out there so everybody's on an e even playing field. That's probably the direction I'd look. So, um, you know, uh, the maple leaf, we don't, we don't know anything about Jim Ortega. We don't know where any of the strains that he got came from. Mm -hmm. we, Zero documented anything about, he's still alive. Yeah. So it's possible that he could um, come out and tell some stuff, mm -hmm. uh, but it is a mystery. We know. Love him too. We'd love to have him on. We know, we know the story of his work basically as soon as he started trading to Neville. Yeah. That's when he pops up and you know, the, um, we can talk a little bit about the maple leaf. So the maple leaf Neville's talked about extensively. Uh, when he first started growing it out, he started getting some sweet big bud types. Um, and then he started growing more of it out. And then he found some more like hash plant types, some dark, hashy, thick types. He called those types Ortega. Uh, and then he started growing more out. And then he eventually found what he considered two skunk archetypes which he called Afghan T and Afghan S. 
and and it's important again because when most people hear skunk, they think skunk one. He wasn't referring to skunk one types in this Afghani. No, he was just kind of a little bit of the structure, a little bit of the nose, yeah. a bit of the look, that type of thing. And what he said about it is that so obviously the the maple leaf was kind of a a hodgepodge of different phenos that popped out of indica. Mm -hmm. But what he found is if you took a big bud type and you bred with it, the maple leaf big bud type bred big bud like. Yeah. You took an Ortega type, the hash plant type, and you bred with it, it sort of ended up being hash plant. So they kind of bred true to type yeah. when they popped up. If you bred with the Afghan T or Afghan S, it also breeded true. Yeah. So the T is pretty famous uh, in the sense that it is the mom of Super Skunk. Uh, he claims it's what put the funk in Super Skunk. It's what crossing it back to its Afghan, you know, to an Afghan, the Afghan T brought out the 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 rank. Yeah. It took a it took a kind of a sweet floral skunk and made it reek. Yeah. And so uh, Afghan tea is incredibly famous. Um, because but it's the, probably the least well-known thing we're going to talk about tonight, as well as the, being incredibly famous. It's the least well-known, but it's the mother of one of the most famous strains out there. And, and possibly skunk. the reason why that strain was so hunted nowadays. Yeah, Super Skunk is probably one of the most well-known cannabis strains in the world. Uh, and he says that that's what made it super. Yep. Reading the Afghan tea. Um, Afghan tea also crossed well with haze. And there's a thing called Afghan haze mm -hmm. that um, Mr. Knight. Um, and uh, that's supposed to be a, uh, a, an Af a maple leaf by haze C. Yep. Um, it's hard to verify, obviously, if that's the case, but uh, we have documentation from Neville that it made super skunk and it, and it crossed great with Hayes C. Yep. yep. Um, so that's kind of that. Um, there's some other stuff that uh, I just answered the Jim Ortega question on a different one. There's some Mendo Perp stuff. I don't know if we'll, that's pretty wide ranging. Uh, that yeah. we, have on. we discussed garlic bud pretty good. We discussed Hindu Kush, the Friesland. And since he star and stuff like that, we'll get to on a different episode. Uh, we'll certainly talk about those uh, a little bit more. Um, you know, uh, where they like to have been coming from the Seattle Greggs group. Uh, all that. Was there a Sensi NL5 line in 89? There was not. No. Nope. Uh, there never was a, a Sensi didn't have NL5 because in 89, the seed bank was still owned by Neville. Uh, and there was never a pure NL5 line offered as far as I know. And there also was never a 1988 Sensi Seeds G13 hash plant. No. Uh, <laughs> do you, can you see the Melvanix garlic pheno of NL5? I'll let Matt take that one if he wants Just to. Just answered it. Okay, so no on that. Um, <laughs> do we know if Neville's kids have knowledge on his father's work? Yeah, I I, his son has some knowledge of it. And I know his son and Neville's sister are currently doing something. Any info on what Kush 4 is? Um, not really. Uh, like I said, Jim Ortega is still alive. He could maybe one day expound upon that if he likes. Yeah. Uh, a lot of rumor about it. There's rumor that the clone might exist. There's rumor that the clone is... Uh, is not it and it's a it's a ignite pure kush it's a cure a pure kush variant yeah a bubba uh, yeah nl2 type variant yeah Hard to say on that level um i got this guy said i got to try a maple leaf from an old timer in georgia georgia unbelievable flavor almost like dr pepper meets roadkill uh, that sounds that sounds good yeah that sounds delicious um when did the silver pearl that Pip works come out? Um, I think we I talked earlier. The silver pearl started being offered by Neville at the seed bank around 88, 89. Uh, it was offered 88, 89, 90. It was one of the strains that got offered at Sensi later on as well. So it popped up um, 
is Steve Hagar just as guilty as Sam the Skunk Man, as aka Dave Watson from Operation Green Merchant? Who's Steve Hagar? He's the uh, guy. He's the one of the uh, the big head honchos. Oh, high crimes. Yeah. Era. yeah. That's a whole subject. Could be a whole podcast in itself, so to speak, with all the rumors and accusations. And there's a lot of people that believe one way. There's a lot of people that believe another way. Um, that's a pretty in depth one. Yeah. That we'll get for yeah, as far as Sam goes, a lot of people do say that there is something to do with federal informants and stuff. I've looked up extensively. I've never seen a damn thing come to light for any proof of any of that. But I will say Neville told me specifically that he said, yes, everybody knew Sam and everybody knew his DEA handler that walked around with him. But Neville also, during that time Neville was telling me that him and Sam were fucking making video memes back and forth at each other. So I don't know how uh, reliable that information is. Yeah, uh, Sam and Neville had famous beef coming from Neville's bust. Dude, those kung fu dub over video memes that they would send back and forth at each other in 2009, 2010, they were, I wish someone still had them. They were fucking hilarious. Um, so, uh, you know, there was, um, there was, uh, yeah. Um, so there's a friend of ours that mentioned black domina. We can touch on that real quick. Sure. Um, so black domina was something that, you know, in, in Neville's, Neville's seed bank era, the vast majority of the stuff that we were talking about in the eighties. And, uh, and this is kind of, this is kind of the same with the super Sativa seed club is they were basically all F ones or very simple hybrids. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of what they were doing. They were, they were crossing pure strains together. They were releasing lines of pure strains they had gotten and they were taking these pure strains like skunk and Northern lights or haze and skunk or, you know, and Northern Lights and Haze, and they were crossing them. Yeah. In the 90s, uh, the, the polyhybrid term started to pop, where you started getting more complex breeding coming in. So <clears throat> Black Domina was a cross of four Indicas uh, that, Neville, that they released, that Neville bred while he was at Sensi. And the mother was consistent. The mother was a one of his favorite cuts. It was a NL1 by Hash Plant. Or by NL1 to say it correctly, actually, because uh, the NL1 was the dad. That was the mom, yeah. and released three versions of it, um, depending on the year. And one of the dads was, um, I believe, Afghani one by NL2. There was another dad that was uh, Afghani one by Ortega, which is maple leaf. And there was the third and final dad, which I believe was the vast majority of the seeds, but it's kind of hard to say. People wanted, uh, with all these pure indicas being crossed together, people wanted a, a larger yielding thing. And so he crossed that hash plant by NL1 to a uh, garlic bud by NL2. Um, so Black Domina uh, had three versions. Yeah, Mom, many oh, forms. Yeah, three forms. Uh, mom was always the same. Uh, dad varied as they played around with what to do. Yeah. It was so, just a really good name, so they just fucking went with it. Yeah, it's a great name. I <laughs> I will say that um, of all my trips to Europe, uh, I lost it, sadly. But a Black Domino uh, Fino I found was one of the best things I ever got uh, yeah. out of Europe. Um, I had a great, great, great variety of it. It tasted peppery. Was extremely frosty, yielded pretty nicely. Uh, it was dark, uh, dark Afghan, not too leafy. Was really it fast too? It was pretty was fast. It, fast? Yeah. Yeah. it was a great cut. I wish I still had it. It's one of my yeah. like super regrets. Uh, we have some good friends um, that there was a rare twelve week pheno um, that was likely a, a recessive garlic bud type uh, that people really liked. They call it the lady pheno. Uh, there was a lot of good. Black Domina. Black yeah. Domina popped. Um, it was probably one of the best later things that Neville did. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I don't know. We can um, so we've probably been talking for a long time. I don't know how long it's been going, but we'll... we'll hour and a half. Hour and a half. We'll tie it off with... Um, we'll tie off Neville, at least, with sort of um, 
the last phase of what he did and why that's important, maybe. And then we'll call it good. Uh, okay. We didn't get to everybody's questions. It'll be hard to get to everybody's questions. But some of your questions might lead to more, uh, you know, more podcasts in the future. We sure. might dive into some of these things and different ones. Real quick, I got to do a giveaway. Um, so whoever, okay, now last time, y'all motherfuckers, I said, whoever had the best question, right? gets the giveaway i'm going to do that again but please don't have four people message me saying that they were that person it really it does get confusing so we'll do a giveaway um what should i give away something that's referencing something from tonight let's do the uh the g13 and all two blue bonnets let's give away a pack of that so whoever had that top question uh message me i will mention real quick the the there's a tie for the two highest questions tonight okay so both of them win and one person said, can you describe the different growth structures, flower times, yields, flavor effects, pros and cons of the different chem cuts, chem D, chem 91, chem cis, chem four. Uh, we'll do a chem dog episode. For uh, sure. Won't touch that one tonight. Uh, yeah. I have a long history with chem. Uh, I got blessed and I got to be one of the earlier people that got a hold of the chem 91. <clears throat> I've had the chem D since 06. Uh, I've had the chem four for a long time. I have a lot of experience with them. We could do a long talk about that. I promise you, you'll hear more about the chem. The uh, most political episode we will ever do, probably. I don't know if that one. I mean, there's there's other ones I think that could cause some fire, but yeah. But we will. I promise you, we will. We will talk extensively about chem. Uh, we'll we'll be popping out these episodes pretty often, so uh, you'll hear about it in the future. Um, so to tie off the Neville bit after answering questions is. Neville was ticked off about uh, working under Ben and Alan Dronkers. He wasn't into it uh, anymore. And so he left in 95, 96. Um, and he partnered with a younger cat named Shanti. Uh, Shanti Baba, we won't talk about him extensively, um, but he came to Europe in the early 90s and he popularized White Widow, uh, great white shark, white rhino, uh, things of that nature. Um, he was also from Australia. He's a bit younger than Shanti. He sort of, um, and so when Neville left Sensi, uh, Shanti, Neville, and this gentleman named Arjun partnered at the greenhouse uh, coffee shop, which should be pretty familiar to everybody that has even a rudimentary knowledge of that. Um, they're they, usually the first seeds everyone buys post 2005. Yeah. They, they, they had a very successful seed bank and they had a very successful series of coffee shops in Holland. Um, I went to them a bunch. Yeah. And so um, basically at that point in Neville's career, he wasn't as interested in breeding with a bunch of Afghans and stuff anymore. What he was really interested in is continuing his haze work because that's, that's what interested him. So, like I said earlier about the Jack Herrera, um, Neville didn't consider that line finished. He just released it under pressure from Ben and Alan Dronkers to coincide with the, seed, with the, uh, the cannabis cut. <clears throat> so after he left Sensi, him and Shanti partnered together and they started taking, they already knew what strains they had. They had two NL5 hazes. One of them was called, one of them we call C5. Uh, which has been spreading around a little bit in America now. And there's some people that are selling seed hybrids of it and stuff. It's finally popped out on our side of the, of the world. And another one was called the, the 122 or the mango, right? And they were trying to work out a poly hybrid using skunk haze that would reflect the qualities of both. So yeah. they were parallel breed. And basically what they were doing is old school breeding. That's a huge pain in the ass in which they were taking different skunk hazes and they were crossing it to these things and they were growing out the kids and seeing if the dad threw the traits they wanted. Yeah. So uh, most people don't do that anymore. Uh, as Matt can attest, that's a super time consuming <clears throat> pain in the ass. The market doesn't let you have a strain and six years later release it. You know what I mean? Like you can't do it. It doesn't, it doesn't work in today's world, but they, he had been working on that for a number of years. He kept working on it. And eventually they found a skunk haze dad that meet their criteria. Neville preferred the line that you see five as the mom. And that line became known as super silver haze. 
uh, won three cups in the late nineties. Probably everybody knows about it. It's very famous. Yeah. Jaunty preferred the skunk Hayes dad crossed to the 122 or the mango. My that preference. One, that one got named the mango Hayes. That's also my preference. I would actually, the, the 122 is sadly not in America yet. It is the nicest NL5 haze I've smoked. Yeah, I'd love to smoke that. My personal favorite out of the A5s, the C5s, whatever. Not that I'm an expert on all of them or anything, but I have in coffee shops and getting to know people over there smoked most of it. That one's amazing. I bet. And I wish I had it. Uh, Mango yeah. haze is dank. But it lives and you can buy it from Shanti still. Um, yeah. He has the 122. He, it's, it's 122 by Skunk Hayes. It's called Mango Hayes. And then he also released something that was the start of his Holy Grail project. His Holy Grail project was trying to recapture the magic of Hayes in an actual line and yeah. not just F1. Uh, Neville talked extensively about how he didn't like most of the polyhybrid Hayes nearly as much as the F1s. Yeah. So he was trying to figure out a way to do that. And so what he did is he took A5, A52, which is on the cover. I don't know if Matt wants to show it, but the A52 is on the cover of the Seed Bank 89 and 90 catalog both. He took the A52. This ugly beast. He took the A52, that one, and he crossed it to Hayes C. And which is the famous dad that, that was used in almost all the Hayes releases. So um, that was the first time that the A dad and the C dad was crossed in the same line. So it was 75% Hayes and 25% Northern Lights. And they initially crossed it just to be a personal breeding project as their Hayes Grail. But they found so much killer stuff in it, they decided to release it. And they yeah. called it Neville's Hayes. There is still a cut of that first find in Holland. It is the strongest sativa I know of. It's almost like a, a uh, maybe the best way to put it is all those old school stories of psychedelic trippy, hold on to your seat sativas that make you see tracers in the corner of your vision and make yeah. you feel like something's talking to you. <clears throat> um, I kind of believe that was bullshit. And then I smoked Neville's Haze, uh, that pheno that they found that became famous, and it literally felt like the top of my head blew off. <laughs> I'm, I'm dead serious. I shared a Fuck joint. That. I did. I, I, at that point, I had, I had the Chem 91. I had Super Skunk. I had a whole bunch of pretty potent, nice yeah. quality stuff. I felt like the stuff we had in America was mostly superior to what Europe had to offer. I went over there. I met a gentleman. <laughs> Uh, who used to work with Neville, became friends. I smoked a small joint with two friends of the Neville's Haze. And it blew my head off. I mean, it literally felt like like air was rushing over the top of my skull. Yeah. I remember holding on to the railing as I walked down the steps of the dude's house. I remember feeling anxious, stoned, tracers <laughs> rushing. Uh, definitely feelings that I'm not used to in cannabis. Yeah. And so at that point, I realized that some of those old sativa stories had the that were true, that some people did get a psychedelic, energetic, almost disassociative type of potent feeling. I don't care how used you are to smoking whatever Afghans you're used to. Yeah. If you have a tolerance to Neville's Haze and you smoke some, you'll probably get knocked off your feet. You know, there was a, a person in the U.S., and, and me and this guy don't necessarily get along the best now, but um, in, in all reality, the best Neville's Haze I've ever smoked has come from Snow High. He had a, an amazing selection of it, and I think he used it in some breeding work. But it was uh, every spice you could imagine in a kitchen cabinet all in one, and it was just it was just so speedy. It was crazy shit. It was really good, though. It was unique. Uh, I don't recommend this, but if you smoke too much Neville's Haze, it feels kind of like psychedelic cocaine oh no, let's just go do it it feels i mean but some people some people feel like uncomfortable yeah out of your skin yeah hot in a corner um you know i that, get that from afghanis which is really weird a uh, lot of them oh it, it really it really uh it really has a, a, a strange feeling um 
I looked for that pheno in Neville's haze. I bought quite a bit of seeds. I never found it. <clears throat> um, luckily, that pheno still exists. It's still sold in coffee shops over there. There's still people that hold it on yeah. that side of the pond. Um, yeah, panic attacks. Uh, it, it, it was uh, certain people don't like it. Yeah, I fucking hate roller coaster weed. That shit sucks. It, don't, but it is. <laughs> it's it's very tasty. It's extremely potent. It hits yeah. you extremely differently than most things, and it certainly was factual. And I'm like, okay, some of these people that are making these stories about ties and Colombians and how it made them feel a long time ago uh -huh. um, are true. Yeah, because that 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 cut has it in spades. Yeah. Uh, it's 75% haze, 25% Northern lights. It's the first thing that crosses both haze dads, A and C in the same line. It's nuts. Uh, I've been, it's one of my white rabbits. Uh, I've been searching for it since the late nineties. I know where it exists. I haven't gotten it yet. I well, hope to get it. Hopefully after this, we'll have, I don't know, nine or 10 companies making crosses with it from the U S yeah. I mean, now that it, we've mentioned it, everybody's going to have it all of a sudden. So here's the crazy, right? Is that thing takes like 16 weeks? Yeah. So it's a super long runner, but it literally yields like three and a half pounds of light. Yeah, that's insane. So even if even if you even if you were to take that 16 weeks and turn it into eight weeks, basically like growing an eight week pound and a half of light strain. Yeah. But it takes twice as long. Yeah. Um, you know, I I saw a, I saw a room in Holland. Uh, I'll tell this story. Uh, before it gets too late, but sure, I walked into a room. I, I saw a room in Holland that was all uh, NL5 haze and Neville's haze, and it was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. They were growing on a slanted floor with drains. They were growing in Rockwell croutons. Yeah, uh, Rockwell is very popular in Europe. Yeah, um, they were growing in one-gallon pots. There was thick, thick stems growing out of these one-gallon pots. They were That's on crazy. They were on constant drip, slow yeah. constant drip, right? Draining out onto the floor. And these stems went trimmed up about six. I'm six foot three. Mm -hmm. uh, they went up over my head. The netting was about six and a half feet tall. <laughs> three feet from about six and a half feet to about nine or 10 feet. There was a mass jungle of buds everywhere. And then six hundreds all over the place. Yeah. It was one of the more unusual grow rooms I've ever seen. Was it all like vertical bulbs hanging in there? No, they were just way up high. Oh, okay, got you. But it's like, so you look at the ground and there's these tiny little one gallons of Rockwell croutons with these big thick stems coming out of the base that went up yeah. further than me. And then right above my head, it just branched into crazy sativa arms. Oh, everywhere. I bet. Everywhere. That's and that's crazy. they threw it for the coffee shops. Um, so that these last two episodes we basically sort of walked you through neville's main breeding era which was 85 to 97 98 mm -hmm. that silver, super silver haze won three cannabis cups in a row uh 97 98 99 most people have heard of neville's haze super silver haze mango haze mm -hmm. and sort of the last major breeding that neville not that neville stopped breeding but he did some much smaller projects and some collabs more with other people. Yeah. Um, it was a bit more about that than I do. But, um, you know, Neville probably had a 17-year run. Yeah, it's a good run in this industry. Of, of really good cool run. great cannabis. Yeah. It went through the Steed Bank. It went through Sensi. It went through the Greenhouse. Uh, you know, he sold a bunch of, we were not going to talk about that, uh, this episode, but he sold a bunch of his stuff and gave a bunch of his cuts to Shanti. And then it continued at Mr. Nice Seeds in Switzerland. Um, and so that's kind of Neville's, as far as his breeding work, that's kind of his arc. Yeah. For lack of a better way to put it. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, that's probably close to a good stopping point. Yeah. Um, so everyone, if you, if you want to get involved in these conversations, I mean, there might be people in the chat room right now that are actually a part of our Patreon that go into the Discord and we discuss all this stuff. A lot of these episodes that we are recording, we do a lot of those discussions publicly with, uh, with each other um, and in that chat room. So if, you, if you're a fucking straight up strain nerd, come join our Patreon. You'll enjoy it. Um, a lot of those other guys can testify to that. 
Um, we also are going to start working on doing some old cannabis publications, making those accessible for people, not like high time shit, but uh, stuff that's off the radar. You know what I mean? Um, that has a lot of old strain info, a lot of old pictures, a lot of old growing info. And uh, all that's available through our Breeder Syndicate Patreon. So join up. Be sure to uh, do that. Make sure. And, and uh, we put up the Crowdcast links in the bio on Breeder Syndicate for each new one. Be sure to sign up for each one. It doesn't send notifications every time unless you sign up for it. So that's uh, that's the housekeeping details, I think. Um, I mean, the other thing we could say is we say this every time. We have a Discord server that's Breeder Syndicate. Um, you can ask Matt and I questions. We're pretty responsive on there. Uh, you know, we pop in fairly often. We're going to also be doing some shorts soon. Not every subject requires an hour and a half or something like that to discuss. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be doing a, a series of shorts coming up, 5, 10, 15 minutes about various topics. Um, so sometimes your question might not get talked about, but it might lead to a 10 or 15 minute short where we talk about things. Uh, we hopefully have some pretty cool old school breeders that we're going to be bringing on. Uh, in, the, in the future, we're going to be doing this on a regular basis, both the shorts and the long and the long factor. It won't just be me and Matt. Uh, some breeders are shy. Some are busy. Some are both. Uh, we're going to do our best to add in some extra people and, and get, you know, pretty historical. So for all that, you can reach us on a Patron. You can reach us on this. The breeder Patron syndicate. is a damn tequila. Oh, Patreon. Yeah. Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> So um, all that, there's various ways you can get a hold of us. We want to keep this kind of thing rolling. I hope it was interesting to everybody. I promise in the future, Matt will talk more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they don't want that. They're sick of my ass. They so, love this. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, I thank everybody for listening. I hope you find it. I hope you thought it was cool. I hope you learned some things. And uh, everybody, thank you very much for signing up and listening for everybody that stuck with us. You have a great Peace. day. Peace, everybody.